Well, hi, uh, Peter Knight and Sue Wallace, your two local authors. You live quite close to Avebury, like myself. It's really great that you could make the time to speak to me about your work and, and your book. So, hi. Hi. Hi, hi Maria. Maria. Good to hear from you during this, uh, this these weird times. <laughs> yeah. So, Peter, you're a bit like myself and Sue, uh, you're a dowser, you're an author, and you've written your latest book, which is really, you know, quite something else from what you've usually written about, about sacred sites. You've gone back to, like, natural places. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, we, uh, we've uh, always uh, kind of worked with stone sites and stone circles, and we did the book about West Kennet and the CERN giant and all that sort of thing, and we still take people to sacred sites on tours, of course we do. They are wonderful places. But um, I think it was something to do with us being environmentalists uh, and what's happening with the climate at the moment. And, and for all this knowledge we're gaining on the pyramids and Gebekli Tepe and all of that, which is truly wonderful, you know, we still see the climate going down the pan. Uh, so we wanted, we thought, how can we um, get people in touch uh, with what perhaps the land again and we thought well let's go let's go back in time and see what the hunter gatherers were doing thousands of years ago because of course they had a real close connection with the land and to get back to nature so, so that people can really connect with mother gaia again um you know we have so many wonderful places in britain so why not really enjoy them and really learn about these wonderful sacred places so that's, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, so I'm so much in resonance with that because, yes, yeah, putting it back to Gaia. So let's let's talk about some of those magical places then. Well, by, by sheer coincidence, we have a copy of our book here. So <laughs> that's what it's all about. Uh, Albion Dreamtime, uh, connect, re-enchanting the Isle of Dragons. Um, so what we did, uh, a lovely book, 800 pictures in there. Believe it or not, we did a we did a big format, but it's not a coffee table book. It's uh, we want we had to do all those images to kind of um, try and show people the wonderful sacred sites that we'd connected. How can you do a book about nature in black and white? It just didn't work for us. So uh, it was a big outlay and a big commitment, but we basically uh -huh. spent a few years going round natural sacred sites, places that we felt were sacred. Uh, thousands of years ago to our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So we looked at the uh, Neanderthals, we looked at the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, and there's lots of evidence now that both of those peoples had a sense of spirituality. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's given. Uh, and when you look at all the Ice Age cave paintings across Europe, I think there's no doubt that shamanism was around them. Um, so we looked at all these ancient places and we visited about a hundred of them. So it's kind of our, our diary uh, of, of our visits and the wonderful things that we experienced, uh, you know, uh, at all these places. It was actually life-changing for us, wasn't it, Sue? Yeah, so, so a lot of the places were either high places, like mountains and tours, and then we had caves and waterfalls and wilderness and forests. So all those wonderful places where there was such amount of, of sanctity and sacredness. You could just feel it just oozing through through the atmosphere. It was wonderful. And wisdom. And and the yeah. wisdom, of course. Mother Mother Nature always in, imbues her wisdom to us. So what was the first place that you uh, both chose to visit? What, what place kicked this off then, Peter? Um, I think, well, we'd already been to some places, of course, uh, in our travels over the years. So some of them were merely revisits. Um, sort of like Merlin's Cave, you know, in Tintagel, St. Nectan's Glen. Of course, we've all been to those, and you can feel the natural raw power of those places. Mm -hmm. But we went all up the country as far as, far as, um, as, as uh, you know, as far as Scotland uh, on our journey. And um, some, you know, sometimes it was uh, uh, caves with wonderful acoustics. Sometimes it was thunderous waterfalls. And, and that you can walk behind. We actually found some waterfalls you can actually walk behind. And a wow, are those raw? Because <laughs> um, you've got a connection with water, haven't you, Sue? Oh, yes. And likewise with you, Maria. Water is so special. If it wasn't for water, we wouldn't be here. And I realise, you know, how, how important water is and how we really need to, to honour and show gratitude for our water. 
because it's so special. Um, so we found a lot of watery places. And the same also with trees, because the trees are the lungs of the earth. They're the conduit between heaven and earth. And their trees become so um, in, in, important for every single culture around the world. So we have the Idrisil and the, the Kabbalah mm -hmm. and all, all of these sacred trees, the world tree. Um, so, so we went to a lot of forests as well. Just, just I, I love the teacher trees, Sue. I just love the teacher trees. Uh, and I love, you know, the tree alphabet and the uh, the Oum uh, writing. So so which which forest did uh, did you explore? Well, our local one, of course, was Savanac. I love Savanac. Uh, we met some of our, our wonderful old oaks, the cathedral oaks, this especially actually features in our book. Um, one, have you have you been to the cathedral? Oaks? Yes, I I knew one of the um, uh, authors called Jack Oliver, who who did a lot of work with the trees. He's he's actually quite famous uh, for for that. And I had my beautiful dog Hunter, who was being really naughty that day, and I just literally bumped into this chap, and I ended up dog walking with him round the trees, and they are so special. They are, as you say, they, they are teachers. They, they pass on the information to the younger trees. So we really need to honour our ancient trees and stop cutting them down, all these people, with take, um, cutting through so for the um, HS2. It's just crazy, they taking are. out our ancient forests. They hold the wisdom of the land. Yeah. Um, and we also went to Kingley Vale, down near Chichester. It's a wonderful yew forest. Oh, I've heard of that. I haven't been there. What was that like? It's really special. Some of some of the trees that have so much character. We actually spotted a dragon amongst them. It was really wonderful. So we've got a picture of that in in the book. I think Pete's flicking through frantically trying <laughs> to find it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah you yeah. you are very special. Can you see it? Can you see the. The dragon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> so uh, we find once you start looking, of course, once you start looking, you find dragons everywhere, you know, in, in the rocks, in the trees, uh, you know, behind waterfalls. And of course, the point of that is those things have always occurred. So back in Neanderthal and Mesolithic times, people were walking across Britain and Europe and they were also seeing dragons in the rocks. And, and dragons behind waterfalls and dragons in the trees. And this is this is partly how myths are birthed, uh, not just birthed, but also perpetuated. So we've got lots of examples, examples uh, of simulacra, uh, you know, and the point is that especially in, in granite areas, some of these look virtually the same as they did, um, you know, in, in ancient times, you know, granite on the moors only weathers about one centimeter in thousands of years. So we're, we're not only looking at similar things uh, to uh, how they how they looked in ancient times. Sometimes we're looking at the actual heads that they were looking at, and that was quite quite a thought, really. We were kind of transported back into the dream time, because in the book the theme that runs through is is that the dream time is here and now. The Aboriginal cultures will tell you dream time isn't some long uh, long distant event that happened. Uh, you know, the only time is now. So therefore, you know, the dream time is now and hence the title of the book. We uh, we're trying to find the dream time places of Albion. Well, I think you've both been very successful in, in finding these uh, dream places from, you know, like you say, from the waterfalls to the trees. So, Sue, uh, we both love water. Uh, which was one of your favourite waterfalls? Oh, gosh, I don't think I could find a favourite. Um... Although I must admit, one of my first places when we decided to do the book, the first place that I decided had to go on number one was Lidford Gorge down in Devon near Dartmoor. Um, have you been to Lidford Gorge? No, I haven't. It's, it's a very steep sided, deep valley with an amazing waterfall at one end. I think Pete's going to show you a picture. Um, called the White Lady Falls. Oh, it's about, it's about oh, eighty beautiful. It's about eighty feet drop of water, 
and it's been my special sacred place for a long time. And then the water falls down into a river, which where it joins another river that has come from another fall at the other end of this steep sided valley, where the water is actually going through, um, where it's been cut through the rock in these deep um, circular cauldrons. It's actually named the Devil's Cauldron. And then the water comes down, down through the valley in this wonderful river. But it's such a magical place. And it's full of nature spirits and, and, and it's just magical, magical place. You must go there. <laughs> yeah, I do love waterfalls. When I lived in Wales, uh, I did a, a few uh, around there. And uh, I, I went to a beautiful waterfall as well on uh, Vancouver Island. And that was full of uh, full of magic, like you say. But what, what I sometimes feel that nature does for me, for example, it allows me, and if, if it permits me, if Spirit of Place wants me, of course, uh, to, to really feel um, so connected to the planet and to Gaia. And, and the magic and the power that nature can impart, I find is a true wonder. Absolutely. You are so spot on with that. Um, and that's what we were trying to, to do with this book. So getting permission initially, as you say, from the spirit of place or the genius loci um, and getting into these places and, and just sitting there receiving wisdom and knowledge. Um, and we found that particularly with caves. I. Pete loves caves, and I, I don't. I'm not very good with, with dark, <laughs> confined spaces. So I took her in 19 caves. <laughs> huge, uh, you're amazing, Pete. A huge <laughs> challenge for me. Yeah. He's showing uh, you some pictures now. <laughs> um, but these, these, to get into some of these caves, we always had to ask permission, of course. And sometimes it, I was denied permission to go in. And I, I would stand there for a while and, and say, OK, is there anything that I need to do that would rectify the situation? And I was actually gifted a chant or a song that they wanted me to sing. And so I would just sing this, this small chant over and over, just, just a couple of phrases. I'm, I'm no, I'm no singer. I'm no musician either. Yes, she is. She's but, a singer. <laughs> <laughs> She's too modest. <laughs> but, but just to sing this, this, a tune, just repeat it, just shortly, maybe for half a minute, a minute, and it changed the whole atmosphere of the place. So that word chanting, of course, has got the word no. chant, and enchantment is all part of it. So we felt somehow that that was the magic. And so it was allowing us in. It was like a magic key that we'd been given. Excuse the pun in terms of key. Um, to, to get into these particular places. It, was, it wanted us to sing this particular song. I, I, I think each, each place had a different tune. Yeah, I think that's that as well. very beautiful. That's very beautiful. Yeah, with the tune as well, I think it was um, it was attuning us to the place, wasn't it? And also perhaps it was attuning us to keep us safe. It was kind of letting us in. Um, each site had its tune and, and sometimes when we left the sites, the caves, we couldn't even remember what we'd been chanting or singing for half an hour. You know, so it's as if they, that, that tune should only be, um, you know, uttered or sung at that particular place. And I think the Aborigines have a similar similar thing on their song lines. They only they only sing specific things at specific places and nowhere else. So that was really interesting. And uh, of course, when we took the time to tune in, you know, the wisdom and the knowledge that we, you know, that we put in the book uh, just came through. And it, it isn't always things that will start a religion, is it? It's uh, mm -hmm. sometimes just very personal things. And, and, and sometimes the message is very simple. I, I think as a species and, uh, and even spiritualities, they complicate things. And uh, I think nature just gets on with what it's got to do, no more and no less. And I think that's a lesson for all of us, you know, that, that it isn't always about understanding things and, and you know, uh, analysing things to death. Sometimes we've found it's all about just experiencing, isn't it? Yeah. And being in the moment. And just, yeah, just being 
simple. Everything being really simple. It's it's just that connection with nature that brings us back to our spirit. That's all we need. And I think now even more when we're all in lockdown and I'm in lockdown by myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so really uh, uh, isolated. But I think, you know, the one thing that I've heard people say on TV, Facebook, Instagram and elsewhere is they can hear the birds starting again. And we have blue skies, no contrails, no chemtrails. So we are thinking uh, about nature more. Yes. And, and the wonderful thing is, the whole planet is sacred. And every single place on that planet is sacred. And that includes your garden, or if you don't have a garden, just, just your living room, your front room, anywhere. Everywhere is sacred. And we, we must learn to just look at it differently and appreciate it. I, th I think that's so true, you know, it is. And we're, we're lucky to, you know, for Mother Earth to let us live the way that we do, you know, because we are taking her. I, well, one thing that I find about nature, she is so loving, Gaia. She's so embracing because no matter what we do to her, our brothers and sisters, our rape and pillage and take and our greed, she still embraces, uh, embraces us. And that is a wonderful mother. Absolutely. I think she's been a very patient mother. I think I think the the analogy of the uh, the divine feminine is very fitting because only only a mother would carry on giving and loving to her naughty children. You know that's a very feminine aspect. You know, being a being a mother. And uh, but she's been very patient. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think uh, you could say the job description of of Mother Earth really is to is to um, keep balance. That's that's what the Mother Earth does all the time. She does balance. The only time you don't see balance in nature uh, is when man turns up. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we feel that, um, you know, a balancing will come. And we were talking about this, weren't we, Sue, about the uh, coronavirus. You know, um, you know, we're almost thinking, is this perhaps a dress rehearsal for things to come? Because at the end of the day, the coronavirus isn't the end of the world in terms of humanity. You know, the plague that went through Europe in the Middle Ages was far worse. But um, it makes you wonder whether whether Gaia is just giving us a few um, a few nudges because we haven't taken any of her warnings so far, have we? So you say it could be a dress rehearsal. Uh, address what what do you mean by that? Well, it could be like a warning sign. You know, if, if we don't get our act together and be more appreciative of, of Mother Nature and, and start treating her with a bit more respect, then she has the power to wipe us out if she really wants to. And, and uh, we don't mean that in the terms of the Old Testament biblical range, vengeful <laughs> God <laughs> or anything like that. You see, as I mentioned just, Mother Earth will, will strive to create balance for everything that lives on this Earth. You know, and um, at the moment, uh, the way mankind is going, that is a total disbalance. It, it, it's it's screwing everything up. So, um, you know, I think Mother Earth down the line eventually is going to think, well, how can I um, redress the balance so that all creatures on this planet can live as they once did? And, uh, you know, you see what our point is there. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And this is why I think, you know, get in touch with nature through the uh, Albion Dreamtime, you know, uh, gives a, a, a case of, you know, look at her beauty. Let's treasure that. Let's preserve that uh, as best as as best as we can. So you were talking about the caves earlier. And Sue, you said that, you know, you you uh, were gifted that um, chant and to sometimes, you know, sing uh, around the caves or chant uh, around the caves. Um, did you feel uh, when you were given that, that that was kind of, you mentioned keys earlier. Was this a kind of moment where you could unlock the door and find out something more about these natural places? Yes, it, it very much felt as if we, we were um, being given the, the key to, to actually enter and, and, and somehow connect much more closely with the, with the spirit of the place and with the place itself. Um, and when we were in there, we were given all sorts of different messages or um, 
just just other different things that that came into our minds about about what's going on in the world so it was was really special um Sounds quite like an oracle as well, you know, like an old uh, oracle where you go and ask a question and sometimes you get that inspiration, you know, that Arwen of a reply back. Did you feel it was a bit like that at times? Certainly in some cases. Um, I mean, Peter was given a, something in King Arthur's Cave. I've been to that one. That's in Herefordshire, isn't it? That's right, yes. Do you want me to read that out, what we were given? Because, it again... Oh, we didn't mention earlier on that um, Sue didn't mention why um, this had to be a joint book. Do you just want to explain that? Because so, it very much it was about the two of us going to sacred sites. There was I realised very early on that we could, I couldn't write this book on my own. That was almost one of the first things that came out, wasn't it? Yeah. So so basically, it was just um, ensuring that we were seeing everything from that dual perspective of yin and yang. So that we both brought our own separate different kinds of qualities to, to the project. So Pete with his very analytical mind and, and he's so used to writing books, whereas I'm more um, kinesthetic, I'm, I'm more into the, the feel of the place with, with the dowsing and, and just generally my, my sensitivities. I think that's one of the big lessons for me during this project, project is that a lot of Sue's processes and the way she does things have, have rubbed off on me. You know, uh, be, being a double Virgo, it's very difficult to turn my brain wow. um, So, um, but that's why I'm I'm into the earth. But uh, so this was Sue's example was a great uh, was great to me just to get myself just to sit there and do nothing sometimes. And there's an example here from the book King Arthur's Cave in the Forest of Dean. We went to a lot of these sites because they were associated with Merlin, uh, dragons, fairies, Arthur. And King Arthur's Cave was uh, was one of those. And um, sometimes I'll do the drumming and Sue will tune in. Sometimes we do no drumming. But this was one example we use uh, in the talk that we do uh, about this book. So in King Arthur's Cave, we growled bear growls and howled like wolves. Perhaps their souls still linger there. But then we have a quiet time, which we often do. Um, Sue goes off into the dark side chamber to gently drum and chant, whilst I, I sit in the main cave and tune in. Almost out of frustration, Arthur, are you here? Are you here? I ask. And the reply, reply is immediate. I, Arthur, am here and will be as long as you remember me, for I am the spirit of the land, the spirit of Albion. My heart opens as Sue continues to chant and drum, unseen in the other chamber. What should I do? I ask. Do as you and others are doing, for as long as people re-enchant my name out on my sacred land, then one day the spirit of Albion will surely rise again. Thank you, I say. And at that very moment, I kid you not, Sue stops chanting and drumming at that exact second in the other chamber. So <laughs> she had been the voice and the drum that had awoken spirit and I had merely been the scribe. So, you know, that sort of thing, um, you, you, you know, it, it just opens your heart and you just... <laughs> Uh, you realize that if you just take the time to tune in, you know, I mean, we do dowsing, we do drumming, we take groups here, there and everywhere. But we, one of the things we do with them all, there, isn't it, on our Dartmoor weekends, mm. is, is, is just get them to sit and feel and yeah. uh, uh, make the space for the spirit of the earth to speak to you. That's what I love. I love, I lie down a lot. You know, and I'm, I'm the opposite of you. I'm Pisces with loaves in Pisces. You know? <laughs> so, so I thought that was funny when uh, you said that. But that is what I love to do. I love to lie down, smell the earth, and just listen sometimes, you know, and, and listen to the, the spirit of the place and the ancestors, uh, which, uh, you know, I feel have spoken, like the ancestor of Arthur spoke uh, to you. And it is a, it's a wonderful experience just to be in stillness at times. And then you feel, and then I feel so much a part of the earth and I feel a little tiny again, you know, like a little tiny person on this massive, big, uh, big earth. And that's, uh, that's a beautiful sense as well. Yes, it puts everything in perspective. And, and have you noticed that the listening is not with your head or with your ears, it's with your heart. Heart, yeah. Somehow seeps into your heart and then you just know it. Really special. 
Yes, it is. So you've gone to caves, you've gone to some uh, waterfalls, and you mentioned earlier, Sue, that you went to some tours. Yes. Well, well, Pete's book um, about Dartmoor is what really led us in, into this book because he was doing the um, studying the, the stone circles and the stone rows and of course the positioning of those ancient monuments were always somehow in regard to the high places that surrounded them so this is what drew us up up those tours Excellent. so that we could see what it was on the tops of these tours that must have drawn the shaman to go there because after all, this is the high place. It's the, the highest connection to, to heaven, if anything. So so Pete's just flicked through and found Hound Tor for a Hound Tor. See. Wow. And there's the hound. And there's one of the hounds. <laughs> Other places. That's brilliant. Ah, oh, so, God love. You know, amazing. The magic is out there. The dragons are still on the land if you go looking for them. And uh, the giants are still there, all those myths of giants. You know, you go up onto Giant Hill, this, that and the other. Carn Bray is a good one, isn't it? We went up to Carn Bray, where there's a legend of a giant. Uh, it's on various ley lines and things. And uh, there's, there's a beautifully formed giant right there looking across the land. So sometimes it's about looking at the familiar, you know, but looking with new eyes. You're going out um, on the land with uh, the eyes of a child, really. We, we'd taken a group up to um, Haytor. Uh, to show them this uh, giant, a giant head coming out of the ground. And uh, as we were doing that, uh, a seven or eight year old child came by and said, oh, look at the look at the head coming out of the ground. <laughs> so you see, children see it. They've got this magic and this belief in fairies. And as we grow up, it gets it just still gets washed out of us, which is really sad. Yeah, and uh, also, I mean, lots of different, you know, cultures all focus on the, the power of the mountain, whether you're in Bali, and the whole access of that island is based on the mountain to the sea, you know, really incorporating uh, the, the nature all around them. Uh, I love the, the, the ancient cultures that just look at the land. Well, yeah, um, all around the world, uh, mountains and hills are held as sacred, you know, and over here, of course, Glastonbury Tour and things like that. And um, I think in, in ancient times, uh, the tours of Dartmoor would have been sacred, you know, only the shaman would have been allowed up there, you know, and, um, and a lot of the stone circles and stone rows are lined up with the tours. Well, why would they do that if they didn't think the tours were sacred or if they didn't think they were the place of ancestors or the place of the, uh, the dreamtime gods? We also went on the track of dragons. Uh, can you see that? Yes, that, yes, wow. On the Isle of Man. I love the Isle of Man. Drinking Dragon. And mm. uh, there are several other called Dirdle Door, of course, is known locally as the Drinking Dragon in Dorset. So we follow dragon, we follow the, the myths and the folklore to find out why these places got their names. And uh, it's quite amazing what's revealed to you, I think, when you're in the right space, when your heart's in the right place. <laughs> Wow, so that's dragons on the uh, the Isle of Man, and you say that you went to some places in uh, Scotland. We did, we did. We did yeah. yeah, oh, Scotland is truly beautiful because you know we we like wilderness. There's still wilderness in Britain. Think people think you've got to go to North America to uh, experience wilderness. Well, there's not. You know, you've got places in Wales and Scotland. You can walk for hours without seeing anybody. And. and no uh, yeah, Dartmoor even, you know, it depends how far you want to get away from people, which at the moment is not a problem, is it? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd walk for hours and then we'd come up, there was a, a giant, the praying hands of Mary associated with the giant. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can. And uh, David Cowan, David Cowan, you know, the Scottish uh, dowser who does a lot of work on there, he, uh, he, he put me in touch with that and... Um, and, uh, you know, some of the places were on powerful energy lines. You know, some places were on the, on the spine of Albion sites, the Bellinus line. Some sites were on the St. Michael line, like um, Stowe's Hill, you know, the cheese ring. Uh, wow, that really, <laughs> all the sim simulacra up there. And uh, so, you know, you, you go down any ley line and sooner or later you'll find there's natural places there. 
And, uh, uh, oh yeah, and, and even back in the day, that's Alfred Watkins noticed the springs, some lakes, and even some trees. We were talking about the teacher trees earlier, like the the pines that used to get on lace. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah. But we, one of the things we were looking for that defined our sites were just we wanted unspoiled sites. You know, some sometimes we went to check out a cave, and there's now a quarry next to it. And uh, sometimes you'd find stones in the middle of an estate. You know, so the, 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 the about 100 sites we've picked out for Albion Dreamtime are ones that we felt you can experience the pure, you know, the pure magic that our shamans used to do. And we went to a place, you were talking about Scotland, there's a place called the Devil's Pulpit uh, and uh, very sacred. And when we're on our way down, can you see that face? Yeah. Yeah. Look at that for a green man. That is about six foot long. And... Uh, uh -huh. Lots of pictures had been taken of the Devil's Pulpit because it was used as one of the sets for the Game of Thrones. But no one had taken a picture of that huge green man. So it's about going around and seeing things with different eyes. And the, and the magic is there, isn't it? Mm. Just, just being aware of what the land has got to tell us. Just keeping an eye open and, and keeping an open mind and heart. Mm. And did you do any sights around Wales? Oh, yes. The, the Welsh waterfalls, of course. So there are a few in, in the Bracken Beacons, wonderful places, waterfalls that you can walk behind, which are certainly challenging in the winter. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> we, visit, we visited some in the summer, and then for some strange reason, Pete had this idea about going back in the winter to see how much more water there was. Um, I wanted it to be edgy. I wanted it to be more edgy. A bit edgy, <laughs> yes. Challenging, um, slippery, wow. <laughs> it's very soggy. But yes, you 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 really feel that rawness, and you you know that thousands of years ago, the shaman would have been taking his initiate through there, and doing the same thing just to challenge them. Yes, I mean that does sound, you know, uh, very very intense going by the water. Oh, yes. <laughs> in, uh, in winter but you but uh, I get where you're coming from with that because you're experiencing it seasonally Absolutely. you know I mean it's all well and good going to somewhere in the summer we both do tours around Avebury and Stonehenge and we've done them in the wind and the rain oh, yeah. Know, yeah. that's so in the summer <laughs> 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 exactly yeah so uh so it's good that you kind of felt that and did you feel that the energy was more intense there in the winter what was the the experience it's, it's different obviously because you haven't got all the tourists around um so often you, we had the place to ourselves it was it was really magical from that point of view and it's much more challenging it's much more raw apart from the fact that you're you're freezing already um it is yes much more um in connection with with mother earth in a much more challenging way incredible we, we we found when we when we went into the real um the wilderness and when we put ourselves under hardship you know physically um I, I find the more you do that actually the more you feel alive <laughs> to us you know um, you go out on the moor in the middle of the winter or in the snow, you know you're going to be the only idiot on the moor, you know. <laughs> but uh, pe people are, uh, are missing that, you know. It's, um, we don't do that anymore, you know. Our houses and our cars shelter us and keep us warm. But when you just go out into nature and feel the rawness, I think it gives you a lot more respect to what nature can do. And um, as you know, nature's, uh, nature's the power. You know, we aren't at all. Mankind doesn't have really the power over the earth. It, mankind thinks it does, but uh, <laughs> that is an illusion. <laughs> well, absolutely. Like you were saying earlier, Pete, you know, it is because, you know, Gaia, uh, she can bring anything upon us. And like you say, she is so, so patient. And that's that's the thing about, you know, about Gaia. But I know what you mean about the the, the safety of things, because I've uh, I've led some uh, walks from Marlborough across the Downs to Avebury as well. And suddenly when you're on that high downs and there's nothing around and you can't go to the car, you have to carry on or go back yes. you know it does it does make you feel that you know that you are on the 
on the edge of something with nature herself. What's the weather going to change if the wind gets up and just things like that. But why I love it when uh, you can feel the rain against your, your face uh, sometimes and it smarts. You know, when you've had hail, hail, it feels like you've had yes. a total exfoliation of the skin. <laughs> Do you know what, what, what I think as well? I, I think the landscape actually appreciates you're out there in the weather like that because you've actually had to make an effort. So the, I think the landscape knows you're more sincere. Anybody can go out on a nice sunny day out into the land and with a packed lunch, you know, and they think they've experienced the land, you know. Well, they have done to a certain extent, but go out, on, go out onto the same landscape, you know, when the weather's not quite so clement. And the fact you still go out there or you make the effort like Sue did to go down when she's dragged into these dark caves where you you can't see six foot ahead of you. Uh, I think spirit appreciates that because I think at the end of the day, um, it's all about intent. You know, spirit reads your heart, I think, before it hears what's coming out your mouth. I, I really believe that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes, uh, you know, uh, for, for sure uh, as well. And I've done some uh, past life regressions on people that have felt they have been the kind of priests and the and the shamans of of the, these these times that you're you're talking about, and in in some of uh, the regressions, the kind of message is get back to who we were. You know these these kind of cultural ways get back to who we were to move forward for humanity. So I think there's so much that we can learn from the the ancestors and the dreaming of Albion. What you're, you guys are doing, you're, you're, you're saying to people, you know, look, here's his mother here. Meet mother again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, we're not we make a point in the book. We, we, we call it the fall from grace we, we, where we where we spot there's definitely a time when uh, mankind's connection with the earth goes downhill. And um, and that's when farming arrives, you know, because uh, you're not hunter gatherers anymore. You don't have the same connection with the land. And although, um, you know, nobody admires the builders of Avery and Stonehenge, you know, more than we do and the pyramid builders, you know, but we started looking at it, looking at it a different way that perhaps the Neolithic wasn't so much the client, the, the, you know, the, the pinnacle of knowledge, man's knowledge. Uh, we started looking at the fact that perhaps the people who built the pyramids and Stonehenge and Avery were merely trying to connect with something they'd lost. Now, how about that as a thought? You know, so uh, it is, it's, it's I challenge. Got, I love people yeah. that challenge the old view, Pete. So I love anything yeah. that gets us to think outside of the box. I mean, the technology is amazing, but perhaps they're doing that because they've all lost this individual symbiotic relationship they used to have. I mean, now in most Iron Age and Bronze Age and, Mes and Neolithic tribes, you'd have a shaman, a man or a woman. So therefore, all that spirit, all those spiritual messages are coming through one person. You know, but I think if you go back in time to the Ice Age and the Mesolithic times, I think everybody once had the the connection of a shaman. That's what we think. We were all more feral. We were all more animal like, you know, and uh, that's what I guess in the book we're trying to get back to, mm. to trying to get people to cut out the middleman and go to Gaia uh, herself. Because, you know, we didn't want to give the impression that Gaia could wipe us off the planet like some vengeful god because uh, she has been very patient, but I, I think, you know, she loves us and she wants to be loved and everything responds to love. Everything responds to love, whether it's the planet, a rock, your, your loved one. Um, so, you know, she doesn't want, she want, I think she wants us around. She's invested a lot of energy and a lot of love in humanity. And uh, I think she wants us to be part of the next part of her magical journey, certainly. But um, it won't be at the expense of all other life on this planet. That much, I'm sure of. But isn't it wonderful, you two, because you said from the very beginning you're environmentalists. And I'm very environmentally co conscious of my hair products, makeup and, and all things like that. You know, I, I really uh, I really am. And uh, I think what we've what we've experienced in this lockdown is, you know, uh, we can change transport possibly 
there's no cars around. You can hear the birds more. There's no, there's less pollution. Maybe we could think about new ways of experiencing things as well. So I'm sure you'll give us some tips of being, you know, environmentalist before we finish. But it's something you said that really touched my heart just a moment ago with, you know, they were the, the Neolithic. And oh, I love, you know, I, I found the long skull people of Stonehenge. I love the Neolithic, you know, but you've made me think a little bit differently. So if we kind of go back to the Mesolithic period and when we look at some artifacts from the Mesolithic period from places like Star Car, uh, a kind of so-called uh, settlement uh, there, they did have these wonderful like shamanic uh, deer masks where they would like it's almost become the animal and the animal would become them. They could become a tree. You know, they could experience nature beyond the need maybe of uh, an organized ritualistic center. That's right. Again, it's it's a very much one to one experience. You know, they, they found by analyzing the caves, you know, in, in France, all the famous caves they got in France that very few of the animals are actually um, animals that they prey on. It's really interesting. Somebody spotted that quite recently. So they're not all, you know, this sympathetic magic isn't always the case where you're connecting with the animal so that it will give itself up to the hunt. Some of that did take, did carry on, but most of the animals that seem to be depicted in cave art uh, aren't animals that they are hunting, which is very interesting. So yeah. they're, connect, they're connecting with the spirit of an animal that perhaps is their totem animal. Or their, or their spirit guide, for sure. Yep, yeah, that's what you do in Druidry, isn't it? In the last phase, uh, you you find your your totem uh, animal, which uh, will probably have have hours. You know, so that's really interesting. Yeah, because of course, in olden days, when we were hunter gatherers, we would have been foraging wherever we went. We wouldn't just be going for a walk. We would be foraging. We would be, have that heightened awareness of everything that was around us. Every plant, every animal, every insect. And we only took what we needed. We yeah. wouldn't take any surplus because there needs to be some left for tomorrow, for next week or, or to seed for next year. So we had this very close connection with nature. We were part of nature. Whereas today we've, we've become disconnected very much, living in our little square boxes and driving around in our little metal boxes. Yes. I, I think it, we, I saw a quote once by somebody and it, and it said, um, you know, hunter gatherers share, farmers accumulate. You know, <laughs> uh, and and that, that really brought it home in a, in a couple of sentences, yeah. Uh, I mean, they accumulate ultimately to share, don't get me wrong, but uh, they're always thinking of ahead. But when you're sun to gather, you're living in the now. You, you can't help to, to be really. And you've got this symbiotic relationship. As Sue says, you wouldn't dream of taking more than you needed. And of course, uh, when farming arrives, we take whatever's necessary to farm. And that's a big difference, you know, for deforestation and all that sort of thing. Um, so, oh, as, you know, as envi sorry, Pete. Uh, as environmentalists, um, what what tips could you give people to reconnect, even if it's just from your your home, your back garden, and you you can't go to an ancient site or a wonderful natural place? Have you any tips? Because I know you grow your own foods, don't you? Uh, in uh, where you live, we try. <laughs> it's a bit difficult getting seeds at the moment. <laughs> But we're doing our best. Just sitting in your garden. But just, but just to sit in your garden, or or even even better, lay down, get down to to nature's level, and look at the plants, and really look at them closely, see the shapes of of the flowers, of the seeds, of of the of the leaves themselves, and learn how they actually got their names because some of them got their names because of the shapes of the leaves or the or the flowers themselves or medicinal. For, for medicinal purposes like heart seeds it's it's a little violet with a heart-shaped leaf and that heart gives you the medicinal concept of, of that it actually being good for your heart so so just just looking closely at whatever's growing in your garden even if it's just the much hated dandelion which we leave the flowers of but we do pick out the seed heads because it can become a nuisance yeah. now 
Our neighbours aren't too pleased about it. But the bees need those flowers just for the nectar. I think I'd say as well, I'd add to that, Sue's done kind of the garden bits, which, which is great, but we are still allowed out once a day for a walk. Mm. And, uh, you know, walk to your local park or even just down your street and look at the trees. And you'll hear that, as you said earlier on, Maria, you can hear the birds now, you know, and, um, you know, just, just, just have a walk around and appreciate nature. Because this is a very unique time, which may never happen again. You know, you can actually walk down a road now without being squished <laughs> and uh, <laughs> go, out, go out of a night and look at all the wildlife. You know, uh, we, 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 the stars are brighter now. We live in a town where we can see the stars. Venus is gorgeous at the moment. The planetary alignment, isn't there? And um, but, uh, we feed our hedgehogs every night and our hedgehog count has gone up through the roof this year. We've never had so many hedgehogs in April. So you see everything benefits less roadkill. Uh, yes, you know, of course. Benefiting. So perhaps Mother Earth is having a look at this and going, ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure, uh, sure she is. So I know this is probably this is a, a silly little childish question, but hey, what we was can your we can give you a childish answer, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favourite place? One of your favourite places, Pete and Sue. Pete, you go first. Oh wow, how can you? I'm looking through the list here. Um, wow, how can you pick? A, you oh, can't. <laughs> I, I just can't. They because we had different experiences at each one. I guess Merlin's Cave is pretty spectacular in Tintagel, and standing in front of Necton's Glen in front of the waterfall. Wow, how how primal that is. You know, but sometimes the sites were small, and we had you know really profound messages, and other times. Sometimes a spectacular waterfall was so loud and so in your face that sometimes we wouldn't get messages at all. Mm. So I, I, I think I can't really <laughs> separate <laughs> because every single site, you know, and there's lots of them, yeah. uh, was different. And I think that really, uh, we, we didn't, we went to each site with an open mind. Um, but I did, I did enjoy uh, Necton's, ca um, Merlin's cave at Tintagel. Because we were given Merlin's, uh, the, we were given the dragon's heartbeat, a very special drum beat we were given there when we tuned into the dragon. So that was very special. When we do our talks and our field trips, we do play that drum beat, uh, and people really seem to appreciate it. Um, so yeah, do, you, uh, your special place. I know what Sue's going to say. <laughs> my, my special place was was number one on the list, as I said earlier on, is Lidford Gorge, in in Devon. Um, it's such a special place for me and it's one of those places where I, I pilgrimage to at least once a year if I can. It's just so special. But then everywhere in, in Britain is special. Albion, these wonderful magical lands. We really must appreciate everything that Albion has to offer. I, is, so if people want to get in touch with uh, with you guys, uh, would you like to tell us your uh, website and where would you like them to buy uh, your book, for example? Because I, I can't wait to get my copy and yeah. I shall be looking at all of the wonderful photographs. And I know the work that you've put in to, to, to this and the time uh, and the love. So tell us how we can contact with you, Pete and Sue. Well, our website is uh, stoneseeker.net, stoneseeker.net. We have a Facebook page and we also have an Albion Dreamtime Facebook page. So if you, uh, you know, search Albion Dreamtime, you can join that page and you can post your own wonderful experiences you've had in nature. It's very much a community site. And um, we've, we've got weekend. If you check out the website, you'll see we've got weekends on Dartmoor, mindfulness weekends on Bodmin and Dartmoor. Hopefully, they will still take place because they're not till August and uh, September. It's so crossed for you. We're hoping those still take place. We've got our convention, of course, every October, which you've spoken at. So we're hoping that that one's safe. So all that's on our website. And um, yeah, please, please get in touch. Well, we, we, we kind of wanted to finish if we can. Are we allowed to just give one extract from the book? Because it's the at the end of... Uh, you, you, can do, you guys, you can do what you like. You go for it. <laughs> Because the uh, we have a we have a section in at the end of the book um, that's very positive. We go on about uh, how activism is started and you know um, uh, XR and all that sort of thing. And we have a, we end up the book on a, on a really positive note. And um, it's um, this is the last chapter really that the last the last page. Um, all this awareness acknowledges that 
I'm not here. All this awareness, knowledge is that the future of humanity depends on the Earth's well-being. William Blake sent us a rallying cry when he wrote, Awake, Albion, awake, and let us all awake together. So please join us to stand exposed and vulnerable on the weathered edge and gaze with ancient eyes across newly perceived re-enchanted landscapes. For we are all children of the Earth's dreaming. So let us all become awakened dreamers, dreamers, for Merlin sleeps within us all. Let us all once again walk gently and mindfully across Albion, this holy land of dragons. So That's thanks for having beautiful. us on. <laughs> that is very, very beautiful. And I really love the words, you know, uh, Merlin uh, is within all of us. You know what, uh, you're close by Avery, both of you. I see you uh, from time to time and in the pub from time to time. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so having, a, having a pint. I really have always uh, admired uh, your work and uh, you're always out there in the landscape. You're exploring different aspects that other people have. You're a very uh, special person in this area. And thank you so much uh, for coming on. And uh, yeah, and get get looking at Pete and Sue's book. They're they're an amazing couple. And thanks a lot for talking to me. And I'll catch up with you soon. You two take care and stay safe. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Cheerio. Bye.